session. We're very lucky to have uh, Nick Bailey and Andy Robinson with us from ThoughtWorks today. So uh, Nick is based in Germany at the moment, yeah. at the moment. <laughs> uh, and Andy's based at the Manchester office, is that right? Yes. And they're going to talk to us about agile practices uh, in web development. Okay. Um, so to start off, I just wanted to explain how the session is going to work. Uh, what we're trying to do is we're trying to run the session in the same way that we run Agile projects. This is definitely an experiment. Um, we've, uh, we've not done this before, so we're going to have to kind of play with it by ear. So uh, the way that we run Agile projects is that typically we do user stories. So instead of user stories, what we have is um, short talks about different aspects of Agile development. Um, and what we do is we, we pick the most important stories to play first. We play those um, through a number of different stages, and that's what we're going to do today. Uh, what we're going to ask you to do um, is to be involved in this in some way. So we're going to try and treat you like product owners. Now, normally we expect, we hope to have one product owner, and obviously we've got quite a few here today. So that's going to make it a bit difficult. Um, but so the first thing to say is we probably won't be able to get through all of that stuff. So the first thing that we need you to do is we need you to prioritize those things. So the things that you're most interested in hearing about first, are those are the things we'll do first. If we get time, we'll do everything. And if we don't, then there'll be some things that we miss off. Um, so there's two things that I need you to do. First of all, I need you to come up and express your interest in these topics. We'll just, we'll just say a sentence about each one so you know what they are. And I also need you to uh, take one each of these cards which will be useful voting and also for feedback. So just, uh, we'll just, I'll just talk through what these are about and then I need everybody to come up and vote. The way that we'll vote is take a sharpie and put a dot on a card if you want. You get three dots each. You can use them as you wish. So you can put all three dots on one thing if that's the only thing you're interested in. Or you can spread them about and then we'll do the, the things that people are most interested in first. So just to say what these things are. Um, so uh, these, are, these, are, these are the things we're going to talk about. They're ones and two, so two talks are slightly longer than one talks. Um, so uh, in terms of the topics that I'm going to talk about, the cardboard, which is basically how this, how this system here works, uh, incremental design, which is about how we then try and design everything before we start on a project, test driven development, which is uh, our approach to writing tests before we start writing code, uh, the burn-up chart, which is the thing that you see over there, which we shall be using to track our progress. We'll also talk about testing, um, in particular automated testing and how you organize automated testing, uh, why we do things in that general way, why we think it's a good idea, and a little bit like pair programming. Nick, do you want to say so? Yeah, so uh, the first one there, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript is about some best practice for that. Uh, feedback loops and everything is about incorporating uh, feedback into agile processes. Web design is, is about aesthetics of how you, and kind of usability. Um, prototyping is a quick and uh, inexpensive way of getting feedback from people on whether you're building the right thing. And user stories are a way that we break down development into smaller tasks that can be given to different people in a team. Uh, and happiness and motivation at work because I'm a big believer in it and uh, so that's going to be talk about some of the frameworks for building a good culture in the team. Okay, so we need you to vote now and we need you to do it fairly quickly, otherwise we're not going to get through the rest of the talks. So I need everybody to come up, grab yourself a sharpie, you've got three dots, and on your way back, if you could grab one each of these cards. We need to do it now. And pass your sharpie on to someone else because we've got eight. Oh. Three dots, three three dots each, then pass the spread on someone else, quick as you can please. Spread them however you like over cards, you can put three on one or one on each. <laughs> And we like the sharpest pack at the end as well. <laughs> Thank you. 
uh, tags into it, and they'll kind of write stuff like oh, uh, the font size in the actual HTML itself, um, and that's that's going to cause you a lot of problems when it comes to maintaining your code because you can't see where the things that are related to presentation are and where the things that are related to the meaning, the semantics of your pages. Uh, yeah, so it, mixing them together is not a good idea. It's going to cause you lots of long-term problems. It might seem like a short-term thing that you can do, um, but it's going to be very difficult in the long term. Um, so other ways that your content might be consumed, uh, might be consumed by mobile browsers. So if you've separated out your CSS into a separate file, you can serve a separate file for mobile devices, um, which adjust to the form factor of it, for example, or you can serve a separate file for uh, print styles so that when people print, um, they don't end up getting kind of too much color information, for example, maybe, or whatever it happens to be. So you can do a nice layout for different, different formats. Um, in terms of semantics, HTML5 now offers you a bit more control than HTML4 over semantics. You can mark up your content in a much more semantic way, which means that a uh, search engine is going to uh, rank it higher. Uh, they'll be able to provide uh, more information. It'll provide more information for things like browser plugins, for example, which, um, so I don't know, there's a browser plugin called Readability, for example, which uh, gives you a little button in your browser and you click on it, and it will um, strip out all the extra content, uh, extra stuff like adverts and images and stuff and allow you to focus on a kind of article style uh, way of reading the content. Um, so if you mark up your content in, in a nice structured way with the new HTML5 elements where they make sense, then that, that will uh, really help people out when they browse your content in different ways. Not everyone uses the same browser that you, you use. Um, okay, I always already said that. So, uh, sorry. so <laughs> I think I've covered a lot of this. Um, so, so some more benefits of structuring uh, your code into separate files for front-end code, like the CSS in one file, the JavaScript in, in other files, and your HTML in separate files again really separating out so you can modularize it and you can look at the particular parts that you're interested in at the time and not have to deal with, with a lot of content all at once. Um, so you can, it also allows you to do progressive enhancement, which means that you can uh, layer on, so you can have HTML at the base layer, and I'll show you an example of this at the end, um, CSS layered on top of that and JavaScript layered on top of it further. So if you turn one of those technologies off, the page still falls back to, to uh, other content which can be consumed like on a BlackBerry, for example, an old BlackBerry that doesn't have JavaScript uh, in the browser. Yes. Yeah. Add six minutes in. Okay. Uh, so talks about cross-browser support, mobile device support. Uh, it also makes your pages load faster. And uh, helps with search optimization. So there we go. And uh, make sure that you you check that browsers are supported before you start using new technologies like CSS3. CSS4 will be coming eventually. Um, they started on the specification. And HTML5 technologies that aren't supported by all browsers. So use the new responsibility. Silence. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned something about points, but what was that? Sorry, you said you got 16 points or something. Okay, um, so this is problem. so uh, we have estimated these stories in terms of points, which is an abstract measure of how big things are. Um, as we go through the, the talks, we'll see how many points we can actually cover in an iteration, and we will chart, chart that on the graph. And this will give us a good idea about how much stuff here we can get through in an iteration. Okay? 
And uh, we'll, see, we'll see that grow as the iterations. We've got about 10 minutes in the range. Okay, so uh, just very, very quick QA. Um, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll kind of get you to give us, give us some feedback. So um, you have three cards. If you like something, hold up the blue card. And if you don't, hold up the red card. So just in terms of this, um, can, can you just uh, vote on this presentation? And then I think we'll finish on this presentation. So blue or, blue or red, please just hold up the card. To be honest, don't hold that. In production, we can chalk those points up in the board, which will do it again in the future. Okay, so uh, just by some, some miracle, it happens to be the first one in the slide deck. Um, what is test driven development? Test driven development is the practice of writing your tests, your tests are written in code using the unit testing framework. Is uh, people familiar with the unit testing framework? Yeah, yeah like JUnit. Yeah, like JUnit, exactly. Yes. Okay, so it's the practice of writing your JUnit tests or your whatever X unit tests before you actually write the code. So, why do we do this? Well, primarily, um, because, it, because the test allows us to capture intent. It allows us to say, this is what I expect the code to do. Um, if you program a lot, what you find is that you spend more time reading other people's code than you do actually writing new code. And one of the hardest things is to understand why somebody did what they did. You know, you can look at the code and you can see what the code is doing, but you never understand why they did it. So the thing about the test is this says, I want this piece of code to do this. Okay. Um, it provides a neat way. We, we usually, when we write a piece of code, we have, a, we have some requirements. It, it, it's a neat way of expressing those requirements and moving from the requirements into code. Um, one of the great things about test-driven development is it stops you from doing stuff that you don't need to do. Is everybody across this? Yeah. Great agile kind of homily. You ain't going to need it. So, one of the things that people do a lot is they develop stuff because they think they're going to need it in the future, and we don't. But if you're, um, okay, that is the end of the interaction. <laughs> <laughs> I will carry on with this. I carry on with this talk in the next iteration, but we should just do the stuff that we need to do at the end of the iteration. So um, we've got we've completed two points in the iteration. Quite often we do some other things around the iteration about thinking about uh, what we need to pull into the next iteration and maybe having a chat with the product owners about what the most important thing is to do now. Um, so we keep a track of how much, how much work we've actually managed to achieve in the iteration and um, we see whether we're actually going to hit our scope line at the top, the red line at the end of the talk. I think at the moment it's not looking good. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm going to keep this uh, presentation in play, and I think we're probably going to pull through one more thing for the next iteration. Um, if we if we do well, we can pull something else through to the iteration. Okay, that was quick. <laughs> I'm very scared. So, yes, test driven development. Um, it's, it's a way of guiding how you develop software. Um, the other great thing about test driven development is that you, you are writing tests as you are developing software. Um, and these tests are amenable to automation. So, unit test, you can, the tests that you write in a unit testing framework, you can also run automatically from your continuous integration server. So one of the things that you're doing is you're building up a whole suite of tests which you can run against your software. And the great thing about that is when later on you go and change something, you can run all of the tests and decide whether you go for something or not. 
So one of the real values of the test driven fund is you get this location suite. Right? You don't you don't have to go away and as a separate activity write regression tests. It's one of the things that you do during test driven fund. It's, uh, it's a very simple activity. So what you do is you write the test that fails to start off with. Because we're writing the test first, there's no working software. So we write the test. If you're writing in a compiled environment, you need to just you need to write enough so that the, so that the software will compile. Otherwise, you can't run the test. But you just do enough so you have you know you write against an empty method that does nothing. So you write the test that fails, then you make it pass any possible way you can. You don't worry about trying to do things in the most elegant way. You just get the test to work. All right? You try and do the simplest thing just to get the test to work because that's what you want the software to do. And then once you've got the test green, you have a look at where you are. So what you do is you have a look at the piece of software you're working on try and think about, has it got any duplication in there? Is there a more elegant way I can do this? And you can make those changes and make sure, by running the test again, that you haven't broken anything. So the rhythm, red, green, refactor. So red, test fails, green, the test pass. We need to think about what state the code's in. Move things around, extract methods, create other objects, but still keep the test passing. So, you, you define the test before you start the code. It allows you to capture intent, move from requirements, and build up regression tests. Okay, we can use, we use this, we use this every day, all day, every day, to develop software. Okay? Questions? Yeah. How do you test uh, user interface before you uh, design it? How do you test user interface uh, with a test first approach? Um, well, you can do you can do a certain amount of uh, TDD with user interfaces in terms of checking that the right things are on the screen. So you can use tools like uh, Selenium, for example, which checks. You can uh, ask it to check: Oh, is this headline present, or can I click through this button and this lo this other page loads, or stuff like that. Um, but you can't, it's, at the moment, there's not really a very easy way of testing uh, CSS, like the presentation information. Um, you can also do unit testing of JavaScript as well. Yeah, that was, that was the other thing I was going to say. Yeah, so it's, you could, I mean, I have, I have worked in situations where you start from, you start from the very top, it's called behavior-driven development, and you look at the user requirements and you express those in a functional test, which, which requires some things of a web page. That obviously don't happen, and then you actually you go down to the test level. But as Nick says, there's nothing about layout CSS. Okay, so other questions? So, so in this um, process, you don't use the uh, domain modeling tool, or anything like that. You go straight from English requirements to code. Yeah, we don't use the main tools. We use we use user stories to express you know a small amount of business functionality. And we might do large projects, or how big the projects? Yeah, some projects are very large. Yeah, how large is very large? Uh, training. Yeah. Larger, the largest one is Trainline, which is um, something like 200 devs per year. Um, that's not a typical thoughtless project. A typical project is 6 to 12 months, maybe you know, between I don't know, 6 and 20 devs. We do favour, we do tend to favour smaller teams for agile development because generally tend to find that as the team gets larger, it becomes very, very difficult to communicate with everybody. And so, um, I mean, perhaps that's why documentation becomes such a big thing in large projects. Um, but it's generally a smaller team can work much faster than a large team because of sharing uh, knowledge. I mean, we'll, talk, we'll talk a little bit about when we go to a design, we'll talk about a little bit about the, the sort of approach to building up the system. Yeah. Uh, don't you think that sometimes writing a test is just a wasting of time? Because if I know, my code works. No. <laughs> Actually, well, sometimes, but um, 
if you are planning on maintaining your code in the long run with a team, then no, I, you shouldn't ever forego your testing. So, so okay, so that's not that's a bit unfair. There's some, some things that I wouldn't test, you know, the presence of a particular string on page, you know, it's very, very straightforward. Some things I wouldn't test. The other thing is that I wouldn't necessarily put all of the tests that I develop into CI. Mm -hmm. So you help the, help the tests help you develop, but you need to be more careful about managing your automated test suite because over time the automated test suite just grows and grows. So you need to be a bit more serious. Yeah, that's the point that was. was uh, okay. For, for, right. a, for example, my uh, the presentation I just gave was um, written in code. I didn't write tests for it because. It's a one-off. I'm not going to maintain it. I'm going to throw it away. So. Yeah, the uh, thing is that I had a course of Agile in a, in a first semester, and I wrote an application. And after that, the lecturer said to me, you should write tests. And I just wrote a test for the application, to, just to make, just to say, yes, I wrote the test. Uh, well, I didn't need it. If, you, if you've written the app, there's, well, it depends what you're doing with the app. It's, it's much harder to retrofit the tests. If, what, we, what we do is we use the tests to drive out the software development. So the testing is not an additional effort after you've got work with software. Um, so, I mean, in that situation, actually, I would say that you're not in a very good place because when you come back to that software in six months' time and you need to change it, then how do you know you haven't broken it? And the answer is, well, uh, I don't really. I'd have to do loads of manual testing or I'm going to have to write some automated tests at that point and not being able to understand the software very well. So try not to get into that situation. Okay. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, compared to traditional waterfall model, um, how does the cost and the development time uh, for this uh, you know, test driven development? I don't, I just, very good. That's such a... We're very biased. Uh, yes, that's just a huge question. My, I've experienced a lot of uh, projects where we're helping clients to transition to an agile model mm -hmm. and um, that's because they've had multiple failures of project, projects in the past so they want a new style of working that actually delivers software mm -hmm. but I'm very biased as you can tell. <laughs> it's still, there, there's, there's, such, there's such a different set of activities it's very hard to compare how this, how this will compare to, to that I mean what I would say is that we have a lot of experience with agile projects and um, we're able to deliver software successfully, mm -hmm. and I would argue maybe we deliver less software, but um, we try very hard to deliver the software. Yeah, means why do you really project the benefit, uh, you know, return of investment? You know, why do you really, you know, if, if it is more, if it is more, the cost is more. So uh, why do you really okay, uh, giving you more of what you want, uh, giving you much better quality, uh, doing stuff on time, because we flex the amount of stuff we do depending on how much we're getting to. You can actually say yes, we'll finish here, but no, you won't necessarily get anything that you ask for. And I can tell you now, you're not going to get all this. No. <laughs> <laughs> Some expectations. Okay, so, uh, okay, so we just need to QA this. So, uh, red and green cards, please. Two. <laughs> okay, so we can see a pattern emerging here. Um, we, have, we have five minutes now that we can just uh, review what's happening. Um, so we were hoping we were hoping to get uh, four four points per iteration. Actually, what we're getting is two. So you can see, here's our, here's our project deadline. 
We're not going to make it. Okay? So, uh, this is, this is uh, quite often the point in projects where everybody is ah. <laughs> um, what we need to do is we need to cut our cloth. Obviously, this is a, this is a talk. It's quite, quite like some, some projects, there's a hard deadline. You have choices. So we could extend the talk for another hour. And we'd, we'd, have a good, we'd have a good chance of making quite a lot of material. Or we need to reduce the scope to the point where we think we're going to actually finish. So or we can do low quality and just rush everything through. <laughs> and then you'll get no learning out of it. Okay. So, uh, I suggest that we reduce the scope to eight points. Okay. And then hopefully we'll get somewhere near. We might, we might do a little bit better than that. So, uh, at this point, obviously that's a very difficult conversation to have with you, the product owners, um, because you're not the organization. Um, um, uh, yes, sorry. I started removing, <laughs> this is, uh, this is me, I've started removing things which you deprioritize or you put low priority earlier and setting some expectations a little bit there. So. Okay, so um, what I am going to do, obviously it takes time to do prioritization and with such a, such a big group it's going to take a very long time. So we're going to have to pick a, a select group of people just to reprioritize the stories that we have so that we make sure that we get them in the right order. So I'm going to pick these eight people here. <laughs> Your responsibility, same, same thing again. Three dots, we need to do it really quickly because we don't have any time. Put your three dots on the blue stickers. We'll do things in that order. You need to come up now. Okay. <laughs> I should, say, I should say at this point that uh, usually what we consider when, once the story is in play, um, that's it, it will go through the pipeline. We don't usually pull stories out of play because it's wasted effort. Um, unless we really know that this, you know, this story is no good, we need to throw it out. So once it's in play, it goes through. If you need to change stuff, you introduce another story that changes, you know, changes whatever we're doing. I mean, I haven't really started this one, but. Um, <laughs> Like get if, I, if I got halfway through, then it would be probably a waste to, to take it out. So. That's smashing. Thank you very much. Okay. So. with web design and then see if we can go a little bit further beyond that uh, nowadays. Um, yeah, flashing animations, confusing pages, all this kind of thing. Uh, where am I? Often you'd ask yourself this when you arrive on a page, you'd be like, what the hell is going on? There's so much stuff in my face, adverts everywhere, it's not very aesthetic. Um, and you don't know where you should go first. So, you know, people scan on the web, they don't read everything, they don't you know, dogmatically read the whole page from start to finish. So they need to be able to scan and see the important things very quickly and prioritize where they're going to click next. And that's really important. And we didn't used to do that in the 90s. Uh, we just make things really ugly, basically. People, I think we were just going through a period where people hadn't really figured out aesthetic designs yet. Um, we do things like this. How do you use this button? 
uh, it is actually a, a sign-up button, uh, but it's not really styled to look like a button. If you aesthetically style something with like a drop shadow on it, make it look real, like a real button in real life, when you click on it, it should compress, the light effects on it should change a little bit. All of this stuff comes really easily now with uh, CSS. So, um, we'd also make things really small, uh, tiny little buttons that you can't click on, um, and you just have to go around with your trackpad maybe, trying to find the thing. Um, so yeah, that's a painful thing to do as well. And weird things happen, like you get pop-ups all over the place, and the uh, the content inside the form, you know, <laughs> doesn't seem to make sense. It's like marketing materials. And then you have the, like, maybe the, the labels for the fields don't actually relate to the fields that, you know, they're, they're sort of positioned all over the place, not kind of in the right place for, for the field itself. Like, what's that stuff we don't even use from? What's that label connected to? I mean, it, for my first one, it was connected to this, but if you put it in the wrong place, it's really confusing. Um, just to make everything blend into one, one thing, moving on from that. We want crap designs. Uh, we want contrast in our designs to make things interesting. We want repetition uh, of elements so that we tie the whole design together. Um, we want alignment of everything so that you can see, okay, this thing is aligned with that thing, so it's probably related to that thing. And also positioning of those things as well. So, yeah, contrast is really, really important um, in design. If you, if you don't make the things which are important stand out from the kind of general information, then people are going to find it really difficult to get stuck into the content of your pages. Um, if you repeat things, like say you get a, you can use beautiful typography to really make a difference to the way your pages go. There's just some attributions for the open source uh, resources I use. So do you have um, reviews in your, in your Agile process, some sort of review by the, somebody? Yeah, I mean, it's the responsibility of the entire team to build a, a good product. Um, so it's not down to, say, developers develop something, they know it's a bit crap, but they, um, they just chuck it over the wall to the QAs, and the QAs go, oh, no, guys, that looks really ugly. Um, I mean, that might happen by mistake, but like, you would hope that... Um, you know, the whole team takes responsibility for trying to make a nice product. We also have experts on uh, design experience designers. Um, we'll have people on the team who have that knowledge. And we try and encourage everyone to be poly skilled to learn a little bit about design, a little bit about accessibility, a little bit about, you know, coding, um, so that people can switch and also understand the mindset of um, building a great product from lots of different perspectives. A question actually. What's the state of uh, typefaces on the on the net? Um, well, there's, I mean, native support typefaces um, is has been a real issue for a long time. It's getting a lot better at the moment because um, there's things like uh, tools which which will um, progressively enhance the page to with JavaScript, for example, to give better type, or um, the Google like things like Typekit. Um, which, um, you know, and Google hosts a load of type, uh, like web fonts, which will be downloaded in the background onto your machine uh, in order to use them in the web page. Because the problem is, in the past, we've been restricted to uh, just the typefaces which were available on your operating system. And for different operating systems or different devices like phones, there might not be the same number of typefaces available. So you end up falling back to a really ugly one. How do you start separating in the in the agile team? For example, there is a web designer that that does web design and programmers, or the, everybody. So um, will be able to yeah, I mean, teams teams. The whole point of agile is that you adjust the process to what works for you. Uh, but in general, what we what I think works well is when people have uh, sort of shallow but broad knowledge in a lot of different areas so they know a little about design as well as coding um, and then uh, perhaps you have some individuals on the team who have deep expert knowledge in particular areas and they can be drawn on asked questions of uh, at the appropriate time 
brings me back to why it's good to have small teams so you can communicate, you know who the expert on that thing is and you can get uh, quick feedback from them on whether you've built the right thing. Okay. Q A. Are you used to the drill? Cards, please. Okay. Right. This is just uh, bits and pieces on the whiteboard. Okay. So, how do you design? How do you design a web application? All right. Let's, let's just imagine the architecture sitting there. They've got a blank sheet of paper, so they say, okay, well, we're going to need a web server, and this is a dynamic application, so we're going to need a database. Uh, okay. Um, I think it's going to be a big website, so we're probably going to need a web farm. Um, we're going to need some, we're going to need some front-side caching. Oh, we've got this uh, web service over here that we need to communicate with. So we're going to need some kind of uh, web service framework. Uh, we've got this other corporate data store over here that we want to communicate with. Well, we seem to be having a few things, so I think probably, probably we need to introduce a great big uh, enterprise service bus. connect all these things together. And this is fantastic because already we've got a very complicated diagram. It's brilliant. Um, we've got months of work there to go away and investigate all of these different things, which technologies we want to, we want to choose for each one of these things, you know, compare them, go and have these great sort of, uh, whatever they're called, what are they called? Requests for, you know, so big tendering process. Lots of suppliers come and present to us and say, we think you should buy our enterprise service bus for our enterprise service bus. And soon, you know, oh, that's end of iteration. <laughs> okay, so how did we do that time? Another two points. Okay, so, so one of the things, one of the interesting things that you find with uh, Agile projects is after a while, you find that the velocity stabilizes. So you will get you will get a more or less as long as there's no major sort of roadblocks, you get a more or less constant thing. So I think we know where we're going with this one now. Okay. So yeah, so this thing. So it can it can easily be uh, six months before we start writing a line of code because we've got all of this stuff that we need to do. So that's uh, rubbish. So we would say, for writing web application, we need a web server. Okay, and well, that's fine. And usually uh, the clients will have, uh, particularly, you know, they'll be a .NET shop, or they'll be a Linux-based shop, or God forbid, they'll be something like uh, WebSphere or something like that. Anyway, so there'll be the. You know, this may be a conversation, but quite often it's fixed by the by the context. You know, all of our servers are Linux, so you know we need we need to run this kind of stuff, and that's fine. And you maybe have a conversation about uh, programming language. Uh, so, you know, if it's a link shop, you might be running Java, or I guess if you really up to the minute, you might be writing in Scala, or I know not so much in. So much in this country, but so many states with the operators who just don't like it. So you have that conversation, and then we would get going. Okay, so we have some requirements. Um, we can start building some software. Okay. So um, and you pull in and you and you pull in the stories, and typically the stories at the beginning of the project are very simple. You know, we just need to get a web page up and running. You know, we need to do this, we need to do that, and gradually build out the software. Okay, and there will come points at which, during this development, that, that we start. So, for instance, 
there'll be a point probably fairly early on where we go, oh, okay, we need to persist some data. So now, at this point here, we need to introduce the data store. And again, you know, that's a conversation, but probably, you know, there may be corporate standards about that. They may be open to doing something a bit more interesting. There's a lot of um, activity and interest around those SQL databases at the moment. But that's another conversation. And you in, so you introduce each piece of technology at the point that you need it. And the point about that is, well, is that there's a number of points. One is this thing again. A lot of this stuff you just do not need. It doesn't help you get to where you want to go. It just gets in the way. It takes forever. It means that you need 47 more boxes to host all this stuff on. And it does you, at the end of the day, it does you absolutely no good whatsoever. So if you drive out the architecture from the requirements as they come in, sometimes, as we've seen, requirements never make it. So you have this big requirement to do something, to access the corporate data store, but actually, as you go along the project, they're going, well, it's not that important, we'll leave it for the minute. It's not that important, and you, know, you come to the end of the project, and you've never done the integration, because it actually, you know, in terms of what they actually wanted from the website, they never needed it. So you could have stood up all of this architecture to integrate with this thing, but actually, at the end of the project, you discover that you didn't need. So you need to, so you need, so incremental design is all about pulling stuff in. Now that sounds very simple, doesn't it? No? Yes? No? No. no. It's really hard. It's really hard because it's really hard not to back yourself into a corner, to go, to go down a blind alley where the next thing that you need to do suddenly becomes really, really hard. Yeah, so we go so far, everything's going swimmingly, we're, doing, we're producing loads of stuff, and then suddenly we need to do this thing, and the entire architecture of the system doesn't allow it, and we back ourselves into a corner. Okay. So let's, this is... Really, this is about experience, and I'm, you know, I'm not the best person to talk about experience because I'm not one of the most senior people at ThoughtWorks. But the people, the people who are the really senior technical people, have the experience to understand. So there's a couple of things that you need to know. You need to know approximately where you're going. All right. It's a very, it's a very hard balance between. We know we've got these things coming up. We know what the bigger shape of the project is. So we, we're not going to go down an alley where we can see that the things coming up in the project are going to stop us. But we don't want to introduce anything into the actual architecture before we need it. In fact, there's, a, there's an agile phrase for everything. <coughs> Agile phrase, which you can go and look up on the web, and there have to be lots of uh, stuff about it, called the last responsible moment. So that is, you make your decision at the last responsible moment. That is the point at which, if you don't make the decision, you're going to get into trouble. So we try and put stuff off as long as possible, but at some point you say, well, at this point, we need to, you know, we need to decide about the web service framework. We've absolutely, we absolutely know that we need it. If we, if we carry on without it. You know, it's going to cost us in, in the long term. And that is obviously a judgment call. You know, when, is, when is the last responsible moment? Well, okay, so, you know, deciding on the web server and the programming language, the last responsible moment is the point at which you begin the project. Because you can't begin the project without it. And making the judgments further on down the project is really quite hard. So you need to know where you're going. And you need to make the decisions at the last responsible moment. And the great thing is that if you can do it, then what you end up with is the simplest architecture that will satisfy the requirements. You don't end up with all of this stuff that you didn't actually need. And what you find on a lot of ThoughtWorks projects, interestingly enough, I think, is that there's, well, there's a couple of things that happen. One is there's a lot less stuff. You, know, you have the stuff that you need and you don't have all of this other stuff. And there's, the other thing is that there's a, there's a strong preference towards certain sorts of technology, kind of technology that don't, 
tie you down, restrict you, restrict the things that the ways that you can flex things in the future. So there's a real strong bias because we're always thinking about, you know, things change, we can't necessarily predict how they're going to change. So there's a very strong bias towards developing the software and using components that we can flex, that are flexible, that we can use used to fit a number of possible things that are going to happen in the future. Because even if you have a roadmap, you won't necessarily be able to anticipate everything that's coming up. And that, you know, change happens, we try and pull change in, you know, we try and accommodate change as much as possible, except when it's a factor work. But big change can stop in a bit. There are certain levels of change which you cannot accommodate. You know, you know we didn't see it coming, it's a huge change. There's nothing you can do about it. Oh, the other thing, the other thing that you absolutely must have is one of the things that we're very, very, very keen on is having a big regression suite, automated regression suite, test driven development. Um, tests at different levels, we'll maybe get on to talking about, maybe we won't get on to talking about testing at different levels. But the great thing about having one of these is that you can flex the system and know that you haven't screwed it up. That you can change things, you can change things, you can change things quite you know, significantly under the hood, introduce a big new piece of architecture. But if you've got a good automated regression suite, that will tell you whether you've screwed it up. Okay, questions? Do you need an to measure the quality of code? The quality, yes. Um, you have to be careful. There's things, things like, there's, there's loads of them. So code metrics, things like, uh, I can't remember, it's check, check style, there's some, there's some basic stuff. But yes, in, in a lot of, in a mature language, there will be stuff that will measure the quality of code. You can also measure code coverage. They're quite interesting stats, but you have to learn not to rely on them. Because there's more to, there's much more to quality than the things that you can measure automatically. The thing about measuring stuff is, if you measure the, if you measure something and it's not quite the right measurement, then you end up performing to a metric which sort of ties you down to doing something. Like say, say you uh, measure the number of lines of code uh, that people write, right? You're going to get weird behaviors because people will start introducing lines of code which actually do nothing or are unnecessary, so you'll have a, an unmaintainable test suite because you're measuring the number of lines of code. So a great, great example is the NHS. They keep measuring, the government has a number of measures about the NHS, you measure the NHS in a certain way, like waiting lists, and then everything is focused towards reducing waiting lists. You know, the fact that that may not actually give you the best quality healthcare service is, you know, is lost in the fact that you're measuring something and everybody's looking at the figures. We can get the same thing all the time. Do you have measures from infield? Sorry, do you have measures from infield? What's not deployed? From infield? Yeah. yeah, you mean uh, production okay. metrics? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we do use uh, a lot of that kind of thing. I mean, analytics is obviously an easy way of introducing that kind of thing, but yeah, there's a lot of stuff you can do around metrics in production to learn, especially things like A B testing, learning from your users, like what they do. I've seen uh, uh, the sales funnel on forms, the sales forms, where you, you uh, work out based on metrics, okay, this field has a 50% dropout rate, we really need to improve the usability of filling in this field, otherwise we'll, we'll lose all our customers. Uh, that's why I've gone on so long, the alarm's not gone I didn't set the alarm. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're, we're done up. Okay. Um, we didn't move. QA? <laughs> QA? <coughs> okay. So we didn't do what we said we do, but we did, we were able to track our progress and make a reasonable guess at the first of the midway point as to how much we could actually achieve in the time available. And that's, you know, that's one of the reasons that we're working on this. Um, so there's one final thing that we'd like you to do. Uh, I'm just trying to think where to put it. 
Um, we just want you to uh, leave one of your cards behind. Um, just do it on this table here. So either, if you liked it, 